Legends throughout the world have spoken of a race of giants that once walked the earth. The Holy Bible speaks about the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of man. It is believed by some that these were the Nephilim, theorized to be gigantic in nature. Arguments have risen in the theological community for centuries as to what the Nephilim were, or if they were indeed the giants that seem to be described. However, what cannot be argued is that Judo-Christian doctrines are not the only ones to speak of a giant human species. Who were these giants that once roamed the earth? Before the Bible was even conceived of, there were oral histories passed down from generation to generation in Mesopotamia, Greece, Rome, Egypt, as well as America. Most of these legends speak of powerful gods and goddesses that were larger than life. History has relegated these legends to the myth status and they are not seen as actual historical accounts. However, it is noteworthy that there were many of these legends all over the world at one point. How did so many different cultures who had nothing to do with each other end up with similar stories of giants? And is there evidence of the existence of giants available today? The legends of giants in Mediterranean countries were probably the most widely known and discussed. Beyond the biblical accounts, such as David and Goliath, there are the accounts of the Babylonian king Gilgamesh. In stone tablets that have been recovered, there are images carved of Gilgamesh taking on a lion. And looking at the scale of the ancient carvings, it appears this man had to have been at least 12 to 15 feet tall, taking into consideration the size of the lion he is portrayed to have slain. Gilgamesh lived sometime between 2800 and 2500 BC. He is the main character in the Epic of Gilgamesh, a Mesopotamian poem that is considered the first great work of literature. In the Epic, Gilgamesh is a demigod of superhuman strength who built the city walls of Uruk to defend his people and survive the Great Deluge. According to the Sumerian king list, Gilgamesh ruled his city for 126 years. Fragments of an epic text found in Maturin, the modern Tel Hadad, relate that at the end of his life, Gilgamesh was buried under the riverbed. It is generally accepted that Gilgamesh was a historical figure, since inscriptions have been found which confirm the historical existence of other figures associated with him, such as the Aga of Kish, if Gilgamesh was a historical king, he probably reigned in about the 26th century BC. Where did Gilgamesh come from? In the Qumran scroll known as the Book of Giants, the names of Gilgamesh and Humbaba appear as two of the antediluvian giants. Could Gilgamesh have come from Atlantis or be a direct descendant of antediluvian kings? If giants existed in the past, where is the evidence? You may be surprised to find that it's been and is being discovered all over the world. Skeletal remains of giants have been discovered throughout American history and even further back. According to Native American Paiute oral history, the Satika are a legendary tribe whose mummified remains were allegedly discovered under four feet of guano by guano miners in what is now known as Lovelock Cave in Lovelock, Nevada. Several of the fiber sandals found in Lovelock Cave were remarkably large, and one reported at over 15 inches in length was said to be on display at the Nevada Historical Society's Museum in Reno in 1952. 
The Paiute tradition asserts that the Satika people practiced cannibalism, and this may have had some basis in fact. During the 1924 excavation of the cave, a series of three human bones were found near the surface towards the mouth of the cave. These had been split to extract the marrow as animal bones were split and probably indicate cannibalism during a famine. As reported in the Nevada Review Minor newspaper on June 19, 1931, in February and June of 1931, two very large skeletons were found in the Humboldt Dry Lake Bed near Lovelock. One skeleton was 8.5 feet tall and was later described as being wrapped in a gum-covered fabric not unlike Egyptian mummies. The other was almost 10 feet tall. It was said that all the tribes of the area stood together against these giants and chased them into a cave. The giants refused to leave the safety of the cave, so the Paiutes, along with other tribes, set the cave on fire. The cave then collapsed during an earthquake, sealing the entrance shut. When the area was mined for fertilizing materials, there were several fossils discovered in the early 1920s. Along with those fossils, were the well-preserved human-like skeletons, one male and one female. The female was over six feet tall, and the male was over eight feet tall. Along with the discovery of the skeletons, there were many other artifacts found, including a circular calendar that had the number of days and weeks of a year etched into it. In 1931, two more skeletons were discovered in Lockport, Nevada, that measured from 8 to 10 feet tall. During the past few years, a huge controversy has emerged accusing the Smithsonian and a host of skeptics and archaeologists of covering up the discovery of hundreds of giant skeletons from Native American Indian mounds. Jim Farira is one of the key people who began uncovering hundreds of newspaper accounts of giant skeletons. To date, Vieira has pulled together about 1,500 accounts from newspapers and books published in the 1800s and early 1900s. One intriguing set of giant skeleton reports he found factual was the Arkansas Chickasaba Mound reports of many large skeletons found at the site. Many skeletons ranging from 8 to 9 feet in length had been found there. As late as 1976, a 7 foot tall skeleton was found at the site. For the Smithsonian to have found skeletons that were 7 feet tall by chance alone is improbable. The height of many of the individuals entombed in ancient American mounds was far taller than the general populace, far beyond what could be explained by simple chance. Why would the Smithsonian cover up such a find? Skeptics have related that the disorder of giantism probably was the cause of many reports, but they actually cite no evidence for this assertion. It is a weak attempt to explain away and dismiss the issue. Giantism is exceedingly rare. So rare there is no actual evidential statistics for it. America has less than 100 cases of giantism recorded in its history. In fact, the overwhelming vast majority of tall people today whose reaching or approaching seven feet do not have the disorder of giantism. The actual percentage of modern humans who reach seven feet in height is 0.00007%. In the ancient world of America's mound builders, the percentage of the population that reached seven feet in height would have been much lower. Skeptics claim that freezing and thawing make skeletons so big they might look like a giant. It was found to be completely wrong and baseless. Modern paleopathology texts and sources relate that buried bones that freeze can shatter and most buried bones actually lose mass. They get smaller. There are also a host of Native American legends that were reported to ethnologists detailing a race of giants who invaded the regions where mounds were found. These giants became the leaders and priests of the tribes. 
Over time, these ruling people, chosen through heredity, became corrupted and were exterminated. You may be surprised at the number of giant skeletons that have been uncovered throughout modern history. There is a number of discoveries that didn't make it to mainstream historical knowledge. Large bones in stone graves in Williamson County and White County, Tennessee were discovered in the 1800s. The average stature of these giants was seven feet tall. Giant skeletons were found in the mid-1800s in New York State near Rutland and Rodman. In 1833, soldiers digging at Lompoc Ranchero, California discovered a male skeleton 12 feet tall. The skeleton was surrounded by caved shells, stone axes, and other artifacts. The skeleton had double rows of upper and lower teeth. Unfortunately, this body was secretly buried because the local Indians became upset about the remains. A giant skull and vertebra were found in Wisconsin and Kansas City as well. A giant found off the California coast on Santa Rosa Island in the 1800s was distinguished by its double row of teeth, common among giant skeleton finds. A 9 foot 8 inch skeleton was excavated from a mound near Brewersville, Indiana in 1879. Skeletons said to be of enormous dimensions were found in mounds near Zanesville, Ohio and Warren, Minnesota in the 1800s. In Clearwater, Minnesota, the skeletons of seven giants were found in mounds. These had receding foreheads and complete double dentation, two rows of teeth. At La Crescent, Minnesota, mounds were found to contain giant bones five miles north in Dreschbach. The bones of people over eight feet tall were found. In 1888, seven skeletons ranging from seven to eight feet tall were discovered. Though they may seem like a lot, near Toledo, Ohio, 20 skeletons were discovered with jaws and teeth twice as large as those of present-day people. The account also noted that odd hieroglyphics were found with the bodies. The aforementioned miners in Lovelock Cave, California discovered a very tall red-haired mummy in 1911. A local native has a dress made from the hair of one of the giants from this area. In 1931, skeletons from 8.5 to 10 feet long were found in the Humboldt Lake Bed in California. And in 1932, Ellis Wright found human tracks in the gypsum rock at White Sands, New Mexico. His discovery was later backed up by Fred Arthur, supervisor of the Lincoln National Park and others who reported that each footprint was 22 inches long and from 8 to 10 inches wide. They were certain the prints were human in origin due to the outline of the perfect prints coupled with a readily apparent instep. During World War II, author Ivan T. Sanderson tells of how his crew was bulldozing through sedimentary rock when it stumbled across what appeared to be a graveyard. In it were crania that measured from 22 to 24 inches from base to crown, nearly three times as large as an adult human skull. Had the creatures to whom these skulls belonged been properly proportioned, they undoubtedly would have been at least 12 feet tall or taller. In 1947, a local newspaper reported the discovery of nine-foot-tall skeletons by amateur archaeologists working in Death Valley. The archaeologists involved also claimed to have found what appeared to be the bones of tigers and dinosaurs with the human remains. And the Catalina Islands off California are the home of dwarf mammoth bones that were once roasted in ancient pit fires. These were roasted and eaten by human-like creatures who were giants with double rows of teeth.
One fact that continues to surface in the discovery of giants is the reports of skulls having more than one row of teeth. According to a study on molecular genetics of supernumerary tooth formation, the cause of extra rows of teeth is genetic. Despite advances in the knowledge of tooth morphogenesis and differentiation, relatively little is known about the molecular mechanisms underlying supernumerary tooth formation. A small number of supernumerary teeth may be a common developmental dental anomaly, while multiple supernumerary teeth usually have a genetic component and they are sometimes thought to represent a partial third dentation in humans. Mice, which are commonly used for studying tooth development, only exhibit one dentation, with very few mouse models exhibiting supernumerary teeth similar to those in humans. Activation of APC or forced activation WNT Canton signal results in multiple supernumerary tooth formation in both humans and in mice, but the key genes in these pathways are not very clear. Analysis of other model systems with continuous tooth replacement or secondary tooth formation such as fish, snake, lizard, and ferret is providing insights into the molecular and cellular mechanisms underlying successional tooth development and should assist in the studies on supernumerary tooth formation in humans. But scientists say this information, together with the advances in stem cell biology and tissue engineering, will pave ways for the tooth regeneration and tooth bioengineering. Though having two rows of teeth is not uncommon, the specific genetics of giants would probably be a specific trait to this line of human development. Along with the reports of double rows of teeth, extra digits in the hands and feet are sometimes reported. Along the Illinois River in a cave, a priest claimed he found prints in rock. The larger representation of the human foot was 14 inches and had six toes instead of five. Morris's universal geography, according to the priest, gives this account of a number of tracks or foot impressions found in rocks in the mountains of Tennessee. Along these were a number of tracks representing human feet and they uniformly had six toes on each foot. Scientists are stubbornly silent about lost races of giants, such as those found in burial mounds near Lake Devlin, Wisconsin in May of 1912. The dig site at Lake Devlin was overseen by Beloit College and it included more than 200 effigy mounds that proved to be classic examples of 8th century woodland culture. But the enormous size of the skeletons and elongated skulls found in May of 1912 did not fit very neatly into anyone's concept of a textbook standard. They were enormous. They were not average human beings. First reported on the 4th of May 1912 issue of the New York Times, the 18 skeletons found by the Peterson brothers on Lake Lawn Farm in southwest Wisconsin exhibited several strange and freakish features. Their heights ranged from 7.6 feet and 10 feet and their skulls, presumably those of men, were much larger than the heads of any race which inhabit America today. They tend to have a double row of teeth, six fingers, six toes, and like humans, came in different races. The teeth in the front of the jaw were regular molars. Heads usually found were elongated and believed due to a longer than normal lifespan. The Lake Devlin find of May 1912 was only one of dozens of several finds that were reported in local newspapers from 1851 forward to the present day. It was not even the first set of giant skeletons found in Wisconsin. On the 10th of August of 1891, the New York Times reported that scientists from the Smithsonian Institute had discovered several large pyramidal monuments on Lake Mills near Madison, Wisconsin. Madison was, in ancient days, the center of a teeming population of over 200,000. 
the excavators found an elaborate system of defensive works which they named Fort Astelin. The New York Times says the celebrated mounds of Ohio and Indiana can bear no comparison either in size, design, or the skill displayed in their construction with these gigantic and mysterious monuments of earth, erected we know not by whom and for what purpose we can only conjecture. On the 20th of December, 1897, the Times followed up with a report on three large burial mounds that had been discovered in Maple Creek, Wisconsin. One had recently been opened. In it was found the skeleton of a man of gigantic size. The bones measured from head to foot over nine feet and were in a fair state of preservation. The skull was as large as a half bushel measure. Some finely tempered rods of copper and other relics were lying near the bones. Giant skulls and skeletons of a race of giants have been found on a very regular basis throughout the Midwestern states for more than 100 years. Giants have been found in Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, Ohio, Kentucky, and New York, and their burial sites are similar to the well-known mounds of the Mound Builder people. The spectrum of Mound Builder history spans a period of more than 5,000 years a period greater than the history of ancient Egypt and all of its dynasties. Most scientists believe that we have an adequate historical understanding of the peoples who lived in North America during this period. However, the long record of anomalous finds like those at Lake Delavan suggest otherwise. The January 13, 1870 edition of the Wisconsin Decatur Republican reported that two giant well-preserved skeletons of an unknown race were discovered near Potsy, Wisconsin by workers digging the foundation of a sawmill near the bank of the Mississippi River. One skeleton measured seven and a half feet, the other eight feet. The skulls of each had prominent cheekbones and double rows of teeth. A large collection of arrowheads and strange toys were found buried near the remains. While a normal sized skeleton of a supposed mound builder is on display at the site of several large pyramidal monuments near Madison called Astelin State Park, the Goliath remains of Wisconsin's giants have vanished along with the hundreds of other discoveries throughout the Midwest. Why? Is there some conspiracy to hide these giant artifacts from the public? Giant skeleton finds have not made the local or national news much since the 1950s for the most part. It seems the opinion is that they fear that people would question evolution. During the time of these discoveries, the Smithsonian was taking possession of nearly every giant skeleton found throughout the entire country, including the largest discovery of skeletons found in the Great Mound in Ohio. What the intent of the institution was for the giant skeletons has never been discovered, but several investigators today believe the Smithsonian was founded, at least in part, to take the skeletons and hide or destroy them dumping some by the barge full in the Atlantic Ocean. Why, one might ask. Some believe it was to hide the true history of the Earth, as giant skeletons were being discovered throughout the world in the late 1800s. And some believe it was to back up Darwin's theory of evolution. If such entities lived on Earth thousands of years ago, then Darwin's theory would be automatically called into question. 
never included in history books is the fact that every Native American tribe in America tells the same tale of having to fight and kill the giants because they were man-eaters and were decimating the native tribes. Perhaps because the giants were so large, the tribes mounded dirt to bury them instead of digging graves, which would explain the hundreds if not thousands of mound burial sites throughout America. Giant skeletal remains have been found from Brooklyn, New York to the Channel Islands off the coast of California. Most of the remains are mass burials with signs of violent death, as if a huge battle had been fought, then won, and the massacred buried deep in mounds to contain them. Most, if not all, of American history textbooks never mention Cahokia, America's greatest city for its time, a very large Indian trading city, 3.5 miles in size, on the site of where St. Louis now stands. It was built about the same time of the Mayan culture and was surrounded by 120 pyramids and farmland. At its zenith, the city had 15,000 inhabitants, which compared to Paris population-wise at the time. The city existed at the same time of the mound builders, and it is surmised that they were the ones who built Cahokia. But the mystery remains, who were the mound builders? In 1170, a mysterious fire destroyed the city when it was rebuilt. Defense walls were built and new buildings, which were all smaller and fortified. The city was never populated or as powerful following that fire. No one knows how the fire started, but the homes that burned were built with thatched roofs and were easily destroyed. Archaeologists have surmised that rebels burned the town and instituted a sun imagery that was used thereafter. But if you put the pieces of this puzzle together, you might come up with an entirely different history. <laughs> Considering the tales of modern Native Americans whose cultures related stories of the giants, you can imagine that they were the ones who burned Cahokia to destroy the giants within the city. When they rebuilt, the victorious Native Americans put up defenses and built much smaller homes to live in because they were not giants like their predecessors. The homes they built were more regulated in size and did not reflect the wealth and stature that the previous larger homes of the giants displayed. David Cusick, a Tuscarawan Indian, wrote in 1825 about a giant tribe called the Ranawakadwa in the Ohio Valley. In his account, he wrote that other smaller tribes grew tired of the giants attacking them. So with a force of 800 warriors, they killed all the Ranawakadwa people. After that, there were no more giants anywhere. Cusick wrote that this happened 2,500 years before Columbus discovered America about 1000 BC. The thousand giants who were massacred were laid together in heaps and covered with dirt, which again could explain the mound building prevalent in the Ohio Valley. One amazing fact withheld from history books is that virtually every explorer who came to the New World encountered giants. Americo Vespucci, Magellan, Coronado, De Soto, and Sir Francis Drake all claimed giant encounters. <laughs> Historically supported by these eyewitness accounts of some of the world's most esteemed explorers of the time, these stories were also chronicled by the Spanish and other lesser known explorers. Stories of giants that occupied Europe comes from the Middle Ages and involves a surprising figure, St. Christopher. While modern stories of St. Christopher simply make him out as an ordinary man, or perhaps a somewhat homely man, those who actually saw him had a different story. According to his peers, he was a giant belonging to a tribe of dog-headed cannibalistic giants. 
Jacques de Hornet in the Golden Legend wrote of St. Christopher. He was of gigantic stature, had a terrifying mien, and was 12 cooties tall. A cootie is an ancient measurement equal to or larger than the English linear measurement of a foot. According to his ancient account, St. Christopher stood from 12 to 18 feet tall, a fact that had been hidden in or even erased from church history. In humans, giantism is usually caused by a tumor on the pituitary gland of the brain. It causes growth of the hands, face, and feet. In some cases, the condition can be passed on genetically through a mutated gene. Many of those who have been identified with giantism have suffered from multiple health issues involving their circulatory or skeletal system. Hypersecretion of growth hormones causes giantism in children and adults. Reports of giantism exist throughout history, with some nations and tribes taller than others. The giants of Crete are listed in various historical sources, beginning with Titan, a Greek mythological giant, and including giantess, after whom giants and giantism are named. Rhodes is another island where giants were said to have lived, with the Colossus of Rhodes, a giant statue of a giant, patron god Helios. Goliath, a giant mentioned in the Bible, was a Philistine warrior who was slain by David in a battle between the Israelites and Philistines. A member of Goliath's family is also recorded as having six fingers on each hand and six toes on each feet. The Nephilim, who are generally accepted to be giants, were the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men before the deluge, according to Genesis. The name is also used in reference to giants who inhabited Khan at the time of the Israelite conquest of Khan, according to Numbers. A similar biblical Hebrew word with different vowel sounds is used in Ezekiel to refer to dead Philistine warriors. Cotton Mather believed that fossilized leg bones and teeth discovered near Albany, New York in 1705 were the remains of Nephilim who perished in a great flood. However, paleontologists claim these are mastodon remains. Is it possible that ancient monuments found throughout the world were actually built by giants? Legend tells that Stonehenge may have such origins. According to Geoffrey of Monmouth, the rocks of Stonehenge were healing rocks called the Giant's Dance, which giants had brought from Africa to Ireland for their healing properties. The 5th century king of Lourdes and Brocious wished to erect a memorial to 3,000 nobles slain in battle against the Saxons and buried at Salisbury. And at Merlin's advice, chose Stonehenge. The king sent Merlin, Uther Pendragon, and 15,000 knights to remove it from Ireland, which it had been constructed on Mount Kilaris by the giants. They slew 7,000 Irish, but as the knights tried to move the rocks with ropes and force, they fell. Then Merlin, using gear and skill, easily dismantled the stones and sent them over to Britain, where Stonehenge was dedicated. It is said that these kings were buried inside the giant's rings of Stonehenge. America also has a Stonehenge, dating back over 2,000 years. America's Stonehenge, sometimes referred to as Mystery Hill, is an archaeological site consisting of a number of large rocks and stone structures scattered around roughly 30 acres within the town of Salem, New Hampshire in the Northeast United States. Carbon dating of charcoal pits at the site provided dates from 2000 BC to 173 BC when the area was populated by ancestors of current Native Americans. In archaeological chronology, this places indigenous use of the site either into the late archaic or the early woodland time periods. It would have been in use during the time of the giants.
bones and monuments are not the only evidence suggesting the existence of giants. Huge footprints have also been discovered. In 1897, the Los Angeles Herald revealed that laborers had discovered a fossil shoe print in solid rock. The imprint was that of a shoe with a high, narrow heel and a broad, flat sole. It was so clear in the fine-grained shell in which it was found that it looked as though the owner had unwittingly put his foot right in the soft mud a day or two before. Sandal or moccasin prints have also been seen in gypsum of the white sands in New Mexico. Ellis Wright, in 1932, found tracks of human form as large as 22 inches long. The white sands were laid down as an ancient inlet sea gradually dried up around the time of the demise of the dinosaurs. The American anthropologist published an article in February 1896 of a large stone bearing the perfect imprint of a human foot 14 and a half inches long. It was shown to members of the Ohio State Academy of Science in 1896. The stone slab had been dug from the ground in a hill four miles north of Parkersburg, West Virginia, some 20 years earlier. In 1938, Dr. Wilbur Burroughs, head of the geology department at Berea College, Kentucky, announced that he had discovered 10 humanoid footprints in carboniferous sandstone on a farm belonging to Mr. O. Fennell in the hills in the southern part of Rockcastle County. The prints were nine and a half inches long and six inches wide. The length between footprints was 18 inches. No marks of four feet or a tail were found. Infrared photography revealed that there were no signs of carving or artificial markings in or around the prints. A microscopic count of sand grains indicated that the material within the prints had been impacted and created as the result of force pressing down on the firmament while it was soft. These facts show that the prints were made by the natural result of pressure from the human foot and in no way could have been duplicated by carving. The rock in which the prints were discovered was estimated to be 250 million years old. In recent years, the prints have been destroyed by vandals. Giant tracks seemingly made by a human being were found by a government tracker in the Alcala Flats area of the Great White Sands, New Mexico in 1931. A year later, a party of four, including O. Fred Arthur, supervisor of Lincoln National Forest, set out to investigate the tracks with the government trapper Ellis Wright as their guide. They found 13 imprints crossing a relic desert basin in the easternmost foothills of the San Andreas Mountains. Despite the great size of the tracks, the investigators were convinced they were human, for the prints were perfect and even the insteps were plainly marked. Oval shaped, the prints are 16 to 22 inches long and 8 to 12 inches wide, with a distance between strides of about 5 feet and a separation in width of 2 feet. In 1882, huge footprints strongly resembling those of a human wearing shoes were found in a layer of sandstone in the yard of the state prison near Carson City, Nevada during digging operations. The prints were between 18 and 20 inches long and approximately 8 inches wide. The stride was about 3 feet and the distance between the left and right tracks, the straddle, was about 19 inches. Since the size of the prints and the age of the rock at the layer they were discovered, two to three million years old, argued against a human or even a humanoid origin. The prints were ascribed to a more acceptable origin, the tracks of a giant ground sloth. It's thought that these animals could stand upright, but only by using their tails for additional support. However, no tail track was found at this site. It was also suggested that perhaps the animal was walking on four feet and that its rear legs were landing exactly in the tracks left by its front feet, thereby creating the impression of a biped. But this fails to account for the fact that the tracks show no toe marks and appear to be sandals.
What may well be the oldest fossil footprint ever discovered was found in 1968 by William J. Meister, an amateur fossil collector. If the print is what it appears to be, the impression of a sandaled shoe crushing a trilobite, it would have had to have been made 300 to 600 million years ago and would be sufficient to either overturn all conventionally accepted ideas of human and geological evolution or to prove that a shoe-wearing biped from another world had once visited this planet. Meister made his potentially disturbing find during a rock and fossil hunting trip to Antelope Spring, 43 miles west of Delta, Utah. His party had already discovered several fossil trilobites when Meister split open a rock with his hammer and made the outrageous find. The rock fell open like a book, revealing on one side the footprint of a human with trilobites right in the footprint itself. The other half of the slab of the rock showed an almost perfect mold of the footprint in fossils. Amazingly, the human was wearing a sandal. Trilobites are small marine invertebrates, the relatives of today's shrimp and crabs, that flourished for over 320 million years before becoming extinct 280 million years ago. If giant footprints are not enough to convince even the most hardened skeptic, then giant tools and artifacts might not budge their restricted perceptions either. However, consider these. In June 1936, Max Hahn and his wife Emma were on a walk when they noticed a rock with wood protruding from its core. They took the rock home and later cracked it open with a hammer and chisel. What they found within seemed to be an ancient hammer. A team of archaeologists checked it and determined the rock encasing the hammer was dated back more than 400 million years. The hammer itself turned out to be more than 500 million years old, according to the same measurement. Apparently, it's so old that a section of the handle had begun the transformation to coal. The hammer's head, made of more than 96% iron, is far more pure than anything nature could have achieved without an assistance from technology. There have been a number of intriguing finds in Indiana over the years, including the discovery of eight skeletons, one clad in copper armor, buried in a perfect circle. In 1888, the Logan Grays, a military group led by A.M. Jones, were conducting military exercises on a small island on Eagle Lake near Warsaw, Indiana. Under a flat stone, they discovered a hole that led to an entrance to a secret cave that was 25 feet long, 15 feet wide, and 8 feet deep. Inside was the skeleton of a 6 foot 9 inch giant buried next to a stream that led to what was called a sacred pool. In 1889, near Kiwana, standing stones were found on a mound, and underneath, another giant was unearthed. While in Whitlock, Indiana, another giant was found in association with a group buried in a seating position. One of the largest finds on record was reported in A History of Jennings County, Indiana, published in 1885. It was reported that in 1881, a nine-foot-tall skeleton was unearthed in a local mound, along with the body of a blonde-haired child. And finally, in 1912, an enormous jaw was dug up that had double rows of teeth, a unique characteristic of some giants discovered in other parts of the country as well. 
What is believed to be the largest Indian stone axe in existence is among the collections of the Missouri Historical Society. The axe is made of granite. It measures 28 inches in length, 14 inches in width, and 11 inches in thickness and weighs more than 300 pounds. When found, the pointed end was embedded in a small mound of boulders and pebbles with the body and head of the axe exposed the whole apparently forming a shrine or altar. The axe resembles a tomahawk pipe. Its upper end or head is slightly hollowed out and in this depression was ceremoniously placed a small quantity of tobacco. A well-beaten moccasin trail led up the incline of the eminence in which the shrine stood, indicating that the place had long been used for religious purposes. According to Chippewa tradition, the axe has been held in veneration by these Indians from time immemorial. The Guadalupe Woman is a well-authenticated discovery which has been in the British Museum for over half a century. In 1812, on the coast of the French Caribbean island of Guadalupe, a fully human skeleton was found, complete in every aspect except for the feet and head. It belonged to a woman about 5 foot 2 inches tall. What makes this of great significance is the fact that this skeleton was found inside extremely hard, very old limestone, which was part of a formation more than a mile in length. Modern geological dating places this formation at 28 million years old, which is 25 million years before modern man is supposed to have first appeared on Earth. Since such a date for a regular person does not fit evolutionary theory, you will not find Guadalupe woman mentioned in any hominid textbooks. To do so would be to disprove evolutionary dating of rock formations. When the two-ton limestone block containing Guadalupe Woman was first put on exhibit in the British Museum in 1812, it was displayed as proof of the Genesis Flood. But that was 20 years before Lyell and nearly 50 years before Darwin. In 1881, the exhibit was quietly taken down to the basement and remains there to this day. Many giant skeletons have been found in or near Native American mounds and burial places. Native Americans have many legends regarding giants. Here are just a few. The Apache have a legend about Big Owl, a malicious and dangerous giant often used as a boogeyman in children's stories. In some Apache tribes, Big Owl also plays a more important mythological role as an early adversary of the War Twins. Like other legendary Apache beings, Big Owl is sometimes described as having a human form, in this case a man eating pork, and other times an animal form such as a large horned owl large enough to carry off a child. Kiwaka are the evil man-eating ice giants of southern Wabanaki legends. According to most legends, Kiwaka was once a human being who either became possessed by an evil spirit or committed a terrible crime, especially cannibalism or withholding food from a starving person, causing his heart to turn to ice. In some Abenaki legends, the stone giants were not transformed humans, but primordial man-eating monsters defeated by the culture hero Glaskabi. Kalowa is a kind of hairy man-eating org from Creek mythology. Some recent Creek storytellers have translated it to gorilla. The Lofa is a malevolent org-like monster of Chickasaw folklore. His name literally means flayer or skinner, a reference to his gruesome habit of flaying the skin from his victims. In some legends, he attempts to abduct Chickasaw women. He is sometimes described as a giant and other times as a large, hairy, smelly man, leading some people to associate him with the Bigfoot legend. Moshup is a giant 
who is the culture hero of Mohegan and Wampanoag tribes, sometimes referred to as a transformer by folklorists. Mashup is strongly associated with whales. In most tribal traditions, he would catch whales to feed the people. And in some stories, Mashup and his children eventually transform into whales themselves. Mashup has a wife named Squanit, who is a powerful medicine woman of the little people. The Champe is a malevolent org-like monster of Chickasaw folklore. In some legends, he attempts to abduct Choctaw women. In others, he is a man-eater. He is sometimes described as a giant, and other times as a large, hairy man, leading some people to associate him with the Bigfoot legends as well. His most salient feature is his smell. Champe's smell is so overpowering that a person cannot bear to be around him, making him difficult to fight. Stoneclad is a monster from Cherokee folklore. Details about Stoneclad vary from telling to telling. In some versions, there is only one, while in other versions, there is a whole race of Stoneclads. He is a stone-skinned giant like the stone coats of the Northern Iroquois tribe. In all cases, he has rock-like plates of armor that protect him from fire, cold, and weapons. He's defeated only through sapping his magical power by destroying his talismans. Of course, many native legends could simply be stories made up to keep children in line. But most historians will tell you that legends are usually rooted in some truth. Native Americans who encountered giants would create stories to pass the incidents down in oral tradition. With the discovery of so many giant skeletons unearthed in the United States, it would have been impossible for Native Americans to have never encountered them. There is strong evidence that Native American folklore about giants is true. Seven foot tall skeletons have been found in burial mounds of southeast towns that were home to the ancestors of the Creek Indians. As European settlers pushed across North America, newspapers printed stories about the discovery of giant skeletons. Some were described as being normal human beings, but very tall others had skulls with more primitive features. The most credible stories of giant skeletons were concentrated in the Appalachians, Cumberland Plateau, and Ohio Basin. They were typically found in graves lined with stone slabs or field stones, known as the stone box grave culture. In 1821, seven foot tall skeletons in stone lined sarcophagus were found in a White County, Tennessee burial area. Legends from Midwest tribes tell of lightly pigmented yellow or red-haired giants living around the Great Lakes or Southern Canada. Occasionally, these giants traveled south into their territories. While some encounters were benign, others resulted in warfare. The Cherokees claim to have killed the last tall white Indians while still living in Kentucky and West Virginia. Western pioneers sometimes found what they assumed were giant fossilized human skeletons along exposed banks and in caves. They described these skeletons as much thicker than modern humans. Some claimed the skulls had double rows of teeth. Several Western tribes tell of past confrontations with lightly pigmented giants with either blonde or red hair. The Paiutes claimed that the giants were cannibals who hunted Paiutes for food. They repeatedly attacked the giants until their numbers dwindled. The surviving giants were cornered in a cave, then either shot with arrows or asphyxiated by setting a fire at the entrance. In 1754, George Washington was Colonel of the Virginia Colonial Militia. 
When hostilities broke out with France, he supervised construction of Fort Luden in Winchester, Virginia. Laborers digging the fort's foundation uncovered a cemetery of seven-foot skeletons in what appeared to be Native American artifacts. The skeletons were viewed and reported by Washington. It is not known what happened to them. This discovery gives credibility to reports of seven-foot-tall skeletons discovered in West Virginia, Kentucky, Southern Ohio, and Southern Indiana. Thousands of years ago, giants roamed the West. Their crude camps and ferocious ways terrorized the early native settlers that had wandered across the land bridge into the North American continent and traveled south and westward into what later became the West and Great Southwest of the United States. Tribes still speak of these ancient days when their ancestors fought desperate battles against the marauding, loping giants, some towering 12 feet tall or taller, that roamed the land, viciously attacking settlements, brutally carrying off screaming women and wailing children for food. Of all the Indian mounds that exist today, most have barely been investigated. The few gigantic skeletons found in some have been dismissed or suppressed as aberrations. 10 and 12 foot humans do not fit dogmatic theories. Usually when giant skeletons are found, they're laughed off as hoaxes. Unfortunately, orthodox science has too much to lose by investigating the mounds thoroughly. Archaeologists cannot deny that the mound builders are real. What they deny are the things sometimes discovered inside the mounds. Over the past century and a half, it's been revealed again and again that some of the mounds and the small pyramids are the burial grounds of huge men, often eight feet or taller, that had a very sophisticated culture. Some of the giants have been found wearing intricate leather armor and have been buried with swords. One such giant was found near Spiro Mound in Oklahoma during the 1930s. Who were these mysterious people that roamed America long before the woolly mammoths became extinct? Were they our ancestors or another race of giant humans from a civilization that predates our own? From the time settlers first set foot on American soil, we have been finding evidence of giants. Most of this evidence has been destroyed or sequestered away in order to either hide the truth or make it difficult to quantify artifacts and harder to study. There does appear to be a conspiracy to shelter evidence of giants, and it has been going on since science has been aware of the bones and materials associated with these anomalies. Our whole history would change if all the evidence of giants could be revealed. Perhaps our civilization is not yet ready to accept the existence of those lofty beings that roamed the earth centuries ago. Or perhaps others have made that decision for us, and we are left with only scant remnants of a civilization larger than life. Eventually, more evidence and artifacts will be discovered. Perhaps then we'll have a more complete picture of our gigantic history.